Um, just a quick uh, a note, this is, uh, this is Mene uh, Pangalos. Um, I can't remember your official title. I'm EVP of Innovative Medicines and Early Development, or, okay. IMED, or IMED Biotech Unit, and okay. also Global Business Development. Okay, and we'll get on to what innovative medicines means at yeah, yeah. AstraZeneca <laughs> in a moment. Um, and this is this is obviously one of the series of uh, Idea Collider interviews with uh, with people with actually very interesting thoughts on innovations. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully interesting, <laughs> Inter definitely interesting, <laughs> and, and, and hopefully very useful for uh, for, for the viewers. So um, uh, actually, let's let's start with that first. Um, First question then, what does AstraZeneca mean by innovative medicines? Yeah, it's probably the, and it's probably the most difficult question because innovation is different things to many people. Um, and actually, I remember when I first joined the company and, and was walking around the sites looking at projects and people were telling me about their innovative programs. Um, and they actually, you know, if, if we think about this as a competitive sport, hmm. um, I think our view of innovation um, when I first joined was personal bests versus world records. Okay. And when I think of innovation, I think of world records. You know, you are you the cutting cutting edge. You yeah. know, the coal face of innovation in terms of the, the whatever area you're in, whether it's a technology or whether it's a therapy area. Yeah. Disease understanding is actually you're making the discoveries um, yeah. rather than following the discoveries. So, so was that an almost an internally referenced versus externally referenced? Yeah, so okay. exactly, they were very inwardly, yeah. I mean, yeah. as an organization, we were incredibly inwardly focused and we were, you know, getting better internally, but when your benchmark is very low, right, mm. getting better on a very low benchmark actually isn't getting you anywhere near where you need to be. So yeah. one of the big shifts in our culture, which I think has helped fuel our innovation, is being much more outwardly focused, seeing what's happening, and as a consequence, understanding where we should be pushing ourselves to be even better and you know, who should we, we should be working with to mm. to enable us to you know build um, on whatever it is that we choose to do that's interesting and the innovative medicines group is is, is focused on the forward-looking pipeline yeah, so I run that? so I run everything from the first target ideation all the way to proof of concept so we have to hand over to our latest stage development organization programs that are ready for phase three. Mm -hmm. um, so everything from, you know, the basic disease understanding to, you know, therefore give you the new targets that you want to identify and then optimizing those programs to generate molecules that are ultimately suitable for phase three investment. So there's therapy area based research and then we also have our technology platform groups to support the therapy areas. Mm -hmm. And you're essentially then combining ways of doing that with choices that you've made along the way of which areas to focus on and so forth. Choices all the way and one of the things that the big shifts that we made, actually, which actually we made when Pascal joined the company at the end of 2012, is really focused down on the areas where we thought we could be globally competitive, where we could be setting world records right. not personal bests. Yeah. And so we really focused the organisation down onto sort of oncology, cardiovascular, metabolic and renal disease, which there's a lot of mm. overlap, and then respiratory mm. uh, respiratory disease. Mm. And then there's a couple of areas that we not dabble in, but we have small, relatively small investments, less than 5% of our, of, of our budget goes on there in neuroscience and, and infection, mm -hmm. where we tend to partner all those programs with, with other companies where that's their core area of competence and where they want to mm. be leading from an innovation perspective. Okay, that's interesting. So it's more like the like the British Olympic team's approach to winning gold medals, right? Where can we win gold? Well, and then go that, deep, so, yeah. go deep. And yeah. then actually it's been very interesting because as we've gone deep and as we've got more and more focused in those areas, you see that actually you're starting to build a depth of knowledge and a depth mm. of pipeline that really does make you quite competitive in that space. Mm. Um, and you know, and then the quality of the partnerships that you, you can create, the quality of the people that you can recruit, the quality of the decision-making, it all gets better. Mm. Um, <clears throat> because the commercial organizations also lined up the same way. Mm. Um, you know, for me, it was like the, the organization was, you know, we were all, I was thought of us as iron filings all going in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. When we focused the organization on those three core areas, everyone started to then point in the same direction. Yeah. And they understood what what good looked like a lot. I think it was a lot, a lot easier to understand what good looks like. Yeah, and it's been interesting. I mean, you mentioned when Pascal took over, but there seems to have been a purposeful shift at AstraZeneca because you know for a long time it wasn't my favourite company. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this, but certainly. The, the, your publications and, and the kind of pursuit of, uh, of a kind of directed improvement yes. has been clear from the outside. Do, do, do you have the room to do that? 
Yeah, look, I mean, look, I was hired by um, by you know, the, the CEO before Pascal joined, a guy called David Brennan, who was a super smart guy, very commercially driven. You know, they'd built a great company with, you know, an amazing brand, Seroquel, mm-hmm. Nexium, Crestor. What's interesting is most of those were were, were, were me too or me better yep. drugs, but nevertheless very successful in their time. And um, what David realized when, when he hired me was that the R&D organization wasn't where it needed to be and, and they had to try and reinvent themselves. And I was one of the first recruits to try and help with that reinvention. Yeah, um, what was the first thing that you had to do under that uh, new regime? Yeah, and it was, you know, it was uh, challenging. Activity wasn't particularly high. So one of the things that I tried to do to really get the organization bought into reasons why we need to change is to learn from what we've done before. So we looked at all of the projects that were run from 2005 to 2010. Mm-hmm. We were spending about $5 billion a year on R&D. Right. Um, and really trying to look at what differentiated a successful project from an unsuccessful project. Obviously, mm. we had a lot more mm. unsuccessful projects. And what was your definition of successful? Launch. Point? Okay. Yeah. Medicine launching yeah. or yeah. moving into late stage development at yeah. least. Um, yeah. But actually launching is the, is the most Im- important one. And looking at what, what data, what information we had and how programs actually progressed from mm. candidate nomination all the way through to phase three. Um, now, what we saw was actually when we, when we did the analysis, if you measured us by the numbers of things that we were doing, the numbers of candidates that we were putting into the clinic or the number yeah. of INDs that we were filing, we were one of the most productive right. companies in the industry, second only to Pfizer after they had acquired Wyeth. Yeah. But if you measured us by the number of launches, enemy launches that we had, we were the second least productive company mm. uh, in the industry. So clearly there was a disconnect. Mm. Our scientists were getting rewarded, mm. right? But there was no medicines coming out the other end. Yeah. And so that's what we had to fix. So the take home message from the, the, all of this work was quality over quantity, mm. right? It's the quality mm. of what you work on, not the quantity of what you do. Mm. Um, and then to, as we dug further, there were f- five things, or we call our five R framework that we thought based on the data that we analyzed, would improve your probability of running a successful program. Mm. And they're pretty obvious, I have to say, pretty intuitive, and yet mm-hmm. actually quite difficult, I think, to execute yeah. on consistently. Yeah. So the first of the five R's is around the right target. Mm-hmm. How well do you understand the biology of the target that you work on? How well yeah. do you understand the disease pathophysiology? Yeah. How it connects or relates to the pathway that you're trying to modulate? Um, what genetic validation do you have, either in preclinical animal models or in human genetics? And how do your scientists constantly try to prove or importantly disprove mm. your hypothesis? Are they asking those killer questions yeah. to try and invalidate, not just validate yeah. their scientific hypothesis? Yeah. So, and, and, and how important is that um, uh, almost adversarial nature? At that, oh, it's, at it's, it's, it's really yeah. important, actually rewarding your scientists for disproving things yeah. as much as proving things and yeah. making good decisions, good kills, yeah. is actually something that we're very passionate about and very proud about and we celebrate as well. Yeah. Um, as, I, as I'll say in a moment, you know, the reason why we're failing now the most is actually because of a lack of efficacy in phase two, which right. means that's we still don't understand yeah. the targets and the pathways yeah. well enough, yeah. but we're getting better. And yeah. so, well, to me, actually, that's the most important of all of the yeah. five R's. Yeah. Good. I mean, I think we've talk, talked about this a little bit before that, you know, we've sort of reframed this rather yes. than calling it failure, calling it, you know, we call the process of early phase uh, development asymmetric learning. Mm-hmm. Can you learn faster and better than the other guys? Exactly. And if you call it learning, it's not, you know, trying it's, it's, and failing it, it, anymore. It's yeah. exactly right. And making yeah. sure that you fail and you haven't spent too much money yeah. and you yeah. don't just keep on. Because uh, what, we what we were very good at, what we saw is we had, our scientists were very creative at finding ways of getting to the next hurdle. Mm-hmm just for the sake of getting to the next yeah, hurdle, because that's, hurdles, what they were, yeah. that's what they were being measured on. Yeah. So right target, second one, right tissue. When you have a molecule, whether it's a monoclonal antibody or a small molecule or whatever the, 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 um, the, the, the drug modality, demonstrate, first of all, in the preclinical models that you can engage the target and understand what your PKPD relationships are. So mm. understand if you've got to inhibit a kinase uh, in a tumor, do you have to inhibit that kinase for 24 hours? Do you have to inhibit it at 50%, 80%, 100%? Really understand what that relationship is in order to generate the efficacy that you're after. And then, even more importantly, you have to have a way of measuring that in the clinic. Mm. If you can't 
demonstrate target engagement in the clinic, we have a big problem because right. then if you fail, yeah. you have no idea if it's your molecule is crap or lousy, excuse mm-hmm. my French, it's crap's fine. Um, or if your hypothesis <laughs> yeah. is wrong. Yeah. So good failures for me are ones where I know that I've demonstrated target engagement, mm-hmm. um, but the molecule yeah, the didn't work, so the, the biology is wrong, yeah. right? Yeah. And we had the, hardly had any pro- any ways of demonstrating proof of mechanism. So the number of phase two studies mm-hmm. that we were running where the molecules fail, then you'd ask the question, I remember those first six months in project meetings, so didn't work. Did we engage the target? Did the receptor antagonist get into the brain yeah. You know, for, schizo- for a schizophrenia program yeah. and quizzical blank stares from everybody saying we have no idea? Oh really, so you yeah. weren't learning well? So you weren't learning anything, not well, you weren't learning anything actually right, right. because you had no idea why you were failing. Yeah, okay. So that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Um, the third one is right safety. So again, because our science were being rewarded for numbers of candidates, yeah. they were remarkably good at working out to lower the doses to the minimum amount, okay. where they're now, because they're not measuring yeah. target engagement, engaging yeah. the target, but yeah. they'd still get their candidate through. Right. And what we saw was that when you had early safety signals, they invariably came back to bite you somewhere during early development or even worse, mm. later stage development. Mm. So weeding out your safety signals early, making sure you're working on the right series and the right scaffolds that you understand both your target-based toxicity and your molecule-based toxicity, really, really important. Mm. So we've spent a lot of time developing our safety models. Um, Fourth of the five R's, right patient. Mm -hmm. Define the patient population in which your medicine is most likely to work, because if it doesn't work in that patient population, it's not going to work in a broader patient population. And we were, again, very good at going into broad patient populations. What we saw actually was that as programs moved through the clinic, the commercial organization got into full Thinking you know, full, full, yeah, full, yeah. full, steam ahead and what well, it wanted to go into broader, bigger. Mm. Of course, AstraZeneca was very much a primary care driven organization. Yeah. Yeah. And so what we saw actually in, in, in the data was that actually the science were becoming less confident about their projects mm-hmm. and the commercial folks were getting more confident because this, the, the, the peak your sales numbers yeah. are getting bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. you know, a hundred percent of nothing is, is not a very big number. Yeah, yeah. And so that was the other piece is to find the patient population and do that experiment first and develop it there and mm. then other things will happen. This is not atypical, not different to mm. what Novartis, for example, yeah. have been doing um, um, for, 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 for quite some time. And then finally, the, the last of the five R's, right commercial. And by right commercial, I don't mean is it going to be a billion dollar peak mm. sales drug. What I mean is why would anyone want to take or prescribe the medicine mm. and why would anyone want to reimburse it so mm. understanding what your comparators need to be mm. understanding what the standard of care will be in the time frame when you're going to be launching yeah. which is a very difficult thing to do Absolutely. right often yeah. 10 15 years Absolutely. Um, ahead um, but really challenging the teams to think about where that puck will be mm. when their programs moves through the clinic or when it launches mm. to make sure they're being ruthless about the comparisons that they do this now goes back to the conversation around being outward looking versus inward looking. Um, and then it was interesting when we submitted the paper for, for, for review, um, one of the comments that came back from one of the reviewers was, well, if you do all of this, you need to add a sixth R, which is the right culture. Okay. Yep. Because what you're actually doing is changing the culture of the company. Yeah. And so you need to talk about how that shifts. And, yeah. that, and, and, and he was actually right, he or she was actually right, because as we've started to implement um, the five R's through every governance meeting we have, through every project review that we do, what you start to see is the culture shifting from one where science are being rewarded for just the numbers of candidates to mm. they're being rewarded for proof of mechanism, for proof of concept, for launches, mm. um, for diagnostic strategies and for publishing great research papers. Mm. And it has shifted the culture from one that's being very inwardly focused mm personal best to one that's outwardly focused, more collaborative and hopefully setting a few world records. Which is interesting. So were you, did you use the incentive structure as a, as a lever or mm. was that a kind of after effect of, uh, of getting people to focus on the right things? So the, in- the incentives changed in that the, um, our, uh, our, our global incentives in the company actually changed when, when Pascal joined where we didn't just have R&D incentives, we had incentives around um, R&D, which mm. were mm. phase three investment decisions, mm. launches, mm. Uh, phase two starts, um, 
then there's a, a set of commercial goals which are around the growth drivers of the company, mm. which again lined everybody up in oncology, kind mm. of asking metabolic, respiratory, etc. Mm. And then some financial goals. Mm. And we, for us to meet our objectives, we have to get all of these things, not just the R and D yeah. ones. So the yeah. whole organisation actually got um, got very well lined up. But for us, the things that we rewarded mm. scientists on were. Um, you know the quality of the work that they were doing so these good kills or good mm. you know moving forward you know cd packages when they were coming forward we, we you know a lot less candidates coming forward every year than we ever had yeah we were no longer the but most prolific yeah. right yeah. but the quality was much higher yeah. and the teams had to be able to cover mm. every aspect of the program including what the development plan looks like going forwards mm. um to proof of concept um, and then the successes, you know, their rewards came when they demonstrated proof of mechanism, mm. when they demonstrate proof of concept, mm. when they get the phase three investment decision, because right. I don't get to decide what goes into phase three. Someone, pulls Someone else has to pull okay. it through, and so yep. that you can't game the system in that way. Interesting. So you've got a neat set of tensions yeah. in, the, yeah. in the system. Yeah, I mean, we've always quoted the a kind of Brazil-Germany World Cup final, is because uh, if you look at the, 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 the goals, yeah. you know, clearly very big divide, but actually Brazil won the game on all of the surrogate metrics. Yes. The shots on goal, shots on target, uh, possession, the Brazil won. But the goals count, <laughs> the goals count. <laughs> launching to, drugs count. Yeah. So the launching yeah. drugs yeah. is, the, and of course the challenge is it's, you know, when you're in a research team, launching the drug is some way away. Mm. Um, now we were lucky that we we had a few drugs that moved quite fast through mm. through the whole process, so mm. people got a sense that we could actually do this. And then the other piece that was a a very important measure for us is actually just the quality of the publications that were coming mm. out of the organisation. Mm. Um, and if you look at you know where we were. You know, I had an organization of about 5,000 people when I joined, and we were publishing, you know, about 200 papers and one nature or science paper, high impact yeah. paper. Yeah. Today, we're half that size. We're about 2,500 people. We're publishing between 40 and 50 nature science cell papers a year. Very so even yeah. those, and of course, when I first joined, it was impossible. You couldn't do drug discovery and good science. <laughs> now, it's part of our DNA. Part of the same thing. Yeah, and people don't even question it. Yeah. And of course, what happens as a consequence of doing it is people want to come and work with you. Yeah. Whether it's an academic collaborator, whether it's a biotech, or whether it's someone that wants to um, actually come and become part of AstraZeneca. Yeah, of course. So it's, uh, yeah. it's made a, a huge shift to us. And of yeah. course, our move down to Cambridge is all part of that shift. It's part of being close to an academic hotbed where mm. there's amazing science. Mm. Um, because we've become much more open than we ever were, which for me, again, is part of my DNA in terms of being collaborative. Um, you know, being collaborative in Cambridge is is really, really easy because right. there's so many people we can collaborate with. Yeah. And of course we have Oxford, London on doorstep and, and the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. Yeah. We've tried to join the UK and Sweden together yeah. to cry, try and create a European okay. hub. Um, and the partnerships we have now, of which we you know we have many, and some quite unusual where we actually have, you know, AstraZeneca scientists work in the same lab as the academic scientists, okay. shared goals, um, you know, working on basic research as well as drug discovery programs. How interesting. It's made us yeah. much, much more porous than we've ever yeah. been. So, it's just, and, you know, the, the thing I mentioned to you before was, you know, we've been doing the Pharmaceutical Innovation Index for, was it nine years now? Mm. And if you look where AstraZeneca started to where AstraZeneca, you know, came, yeah. we're number one this year. It's been a, a rapid turnaround yeah. because I think all the things that you recognize and our index measures, you know, did you launch and did you launch successfully? Did you get reimbursement? Yeah. So clearly you've gone from that, that period when you were doing a lot of internal yes. R&D that didn't yes. get anywhere to yeah. suddenly getting somewhere. And it's been, and it's been say, the, the, the wins are important and celebrating the wins when you get them actually is one of the things that galvanized the organization. Mm. But you know, I think that there are three key things, you know, being really focused on high quality science, being mm. truly collaborative and open, mm. and then executing flawlessly when it comes to moving through the pipeline and launching. Mm. And when you said that you came up with the five R's, yeah. was that a sort of deductive process to come up with? Or were those the five things that mattered the most, or did you go in with... You know, no, it came, no, actually, no, it was, look, I mean, you know, Pfizer had published their three pillars. I yeah, mean, these yeah. things are actually very intuitive. And what's interesting is people ask me about because these are, I mean, they're mm. bleeding obvious, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you think, why well, doesn't everybody yeah, do it? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, had people ask me, well, why do you publish this? Because they're like a yeah, trade secret. Yeah. Yeah. They're not. Right. Everybody right. should be doing yeah. this, and yeah. I think many companies do, but actually many companies don't. Yeah. And when I ask people that join us from other companies, 
about what's different about the way that we do it versus others. It's that we really do practice it. So I don't let program. You know, well, not I. Know, we don't mm. let programs come forwards mm. if the R's don't look good, and if they do mm. come forwards with a gap. Let's say we're not sure about. Um, right safety we have a question mark about whether we're going to have the right mm. dose versus safety mm. liability it's the first question we'll ask in the clinic mm. right so we'll mm. need to under, really understand the, the you know the proof of mechanism mm. the pkpd and work out what the margin so it really focuses the attention as you understand where your liabilities are in a program to go there first yeah. and work out whether yeah. you can yeah. you know flip a red to an amber or a green mm. so it's okay to go at risk as long as you then as long as you know what the risk yeah, is yeah. and you're very clear about what the mm. killer experiment mm. is mm. rather um, than hoping it's not there yeah That's and and then you know of course the first few years projects would come and mm. you say no once you say no twice mm. you take teams through it um and teams change their behavior yeah. so, oh you do mean it yeah yeah oh, okay. oh that's right it does yeah, make a difference yeah, yeah, yeah. that is kind of important yeah, yeah. right it's um yeah. you, you've got you've got to, there's got to be some teeth to it mm. so is there a, a definition of innovation at astrazeneca because one of the things we always find is that everyone has a different um you know approach to what it is and what it means I don't. I, I mean, it, it, like, as I said earlier, it, it means so many things to mm. to different groups. So, you know, for my precision medicine group, innovation will be developing the first blood-based DNA test for EGFR. Right. Um, it's very different to my oncology therapy area, which would be looking to identify, you know, a new target or pathway and mm. get the first molecules or the first crystal structure of mm. that target with the, with 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 the, with the molecule. Mm. Um, so I think innovation really is different things to different groups. I think, as I said earlier, the most important thing is that whatever we choose to do in whichever areas we're focusing, whether it's CRISPR or whether it's Protax or whether it's a, a new, you know, some other drug modality or something around, you know, new safety models that, you know, improve our prediction, mm. that we are aware of what's out there. So mm. we're not reinventing the wheel. Mm. We're working with the very best people mm. and we're pushing the boundaries of science so that um, when hopefully we've cracked something, um, when we publish it, people aren't saying so what. Yeah. Right. I'd really yeah. like us to be viewed as driving science forwards, mm. and not just helping ourselves, but actually helping the fields that we work in also get better at what they do. Yeah. Yeah. And that culture yeah. piece is really important because it's one of the things that I think again makes us a little bit different. If I look at you know when we when we moved to Cambridge. Um, you know the organ, the one our, our new building in Cambridge is right next to the Adam Brooks um, mm. is in the Adam Brooks campus next to Adam Brooks Hospital is next to the Papworth Hospital, mm. and then on the other side we're opposite the laboratory for molecular biology, the MRC laboratory for molecular yeah. biology, more Nobel laureates than any other yeah. institution yeah. in the world, um, and an incredibly you know if you want high powered science that's mm. one of the places to go mm. um, in the world, and. Um, I was talking to John Savile at the time, who was the head of the CEO of, of the MRC. I said, "Wouldn't it be great, given that we're going to be in in Cambridge, to see if we can start working with the MRC, with the uh, LMB?" And so we put a, a small pot of money together that we co-funded, and I went and saw Hugh Pelham, who was the director at the time, and said, "You know, let's try and do something." And of course, his natural first inclination was, "Well, you know, we're all very, very smart, and you're from industry, mm. and we don't want you to." suck our brains dry and us get nothing back interesting yeah. Um, yeah. which I think is you know I think a farmer has moved on a long a long way yeah. over the past yeah. few years but I think it's still in some circles the the, 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 the view yeah. of what we yeah. do and how we work mm. um, and so we work really really hard to build a strong relationship with the LMB and, and to actually make it a very um, easy way to get you know we, we, we created this pot of money that basically PIs from AZ and the LMB could come and apply for and they could get a postdoc and it's a two pager and it would be very, very quick and easy and not, not bureaucratic. Mm. And Hugh and myself would review this yeah. um, and we'd say yes or no, yeah. based on the quality of the science. So together you... Together, yeah, we yeah, did it together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, you know, and of course the first round was, was not particularly well subscribed, but today we work with more than half of the PIs in the LMB collaboratively. Oh. Yeah. Right, and yeah. and they get back as much as we. I mean, because they can see that we can do things. We can create mm. molecules for them. We have certain capabilities and technologies that they don't have access to. But more importantly, there's actually a lot of overlap in terms of our our common interests. Mm. 
And so when you put us both together, mm. we actually get more powerful because we're obviously quite applied in our thinking. Mm. They're quite basic in, the think, in, our, in their thinking. You put it together and actually magic happens. Yeah. Um, and we've got some amazing stuff that's going on now working yeah. with them. Which is an interesting, <coughs> I think your comfort, <coughs> your comfort with open yeah. is, is an interesting uh, di you know, differentiator for, for, for you in that way that you described this sort of long-term approach, you know, uh, proof yeah. of concept, if you like, of going in. Um, have you found it easy to have your scientists behave the right way in, in those collaborations? It's been an, an evolution, yeah. right? Because initially we were incredibly close. We didn't want to share everything. Everything was proprietary. Mm. Um, and it, you just do it in, in, in baby chunks. Mm. You, you, know, mm. you chip away, chip away, and eventually people get comfortable. And there's many examples, of course, and we had to do it because if you think about where we were and having yeah. to try and change the culture quickly, one of the yeah. best ways of changing the culture is actually bringing external scientists yeah. Yeah. in that can show you what world records look like yeah, yeah. Um, so for example you know we, we did we d we did an, another collaboration with the MRC we we made lots of our molecules our clinical molecules available to MRC scientists to try and find new indications for which then spurred the yeah. NCADS yeah. work that's happening yeah. as well and we're yeah. one of the companies that has the most molecules both clinical and preclinical yeah. um, in, in those types of things you know when we set up the biopark in Audley Park you know we had this huge site mm. Um, that was was half empty, and I, you know, I used to wander through the corridors, going from one group to the other, and there'd all be these empty laboratories. Yeah. I used to call it, you know, tumbleweed labs, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you could sort of hear the wind rushing through, and it was, you know, it was, it was yeah, demoralising, yeah. right? From yeah. the era when everyone was investing in bricks and infrastructure, yeah. bricks and mortar infrastructure, yeah. because they thought they could just industrialise R and D and find yeah. out the very hard way that you couldn't. Yeah. So then the organisation shrank, and we had these huge, yeah. huge buildings. And so what we did was we said, well, let's collapse our footprint on the building and then let's bring biotechs in. Mm. So that was actually our first biopark. Um, and in contrast to other bioparks, so is let's not have the biotechs that come in partitioned and walled off. Mm. Let's have them using our cafeteria, our coffee shops, our shared spaces. Let's have them potentially using our equipment if they want to, so they have to buy capital. Mm -hmm. um, and we can really try and share um, our infrastructure, mm. make ourselves good partners, mm. help give them advice when they need it, if they need some regulatory advice, some clinical advice, without any ask, asking for anything in return. Mm. Um, but what it does is then it starts to encourage biotechs to come in. Mm. It makes us again start to forge relationships with, with, with other companies and probably m most importantly, it starts to fill the space up and make it feel mm. vibrant and energetic mm. and which, full. Which is an interestingly human approach to there's this great book, Obliquity, which talks about, you know, getting what you want, but approaching it in an oblique way. And you've described a lot of internal and external yeah. um, signals yes. about your readiness to embrace the future instead of the past. How, how important and, 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 is that? And treat people like grounds. I mean, the other thing yeah. is treating people like grounds, because, again, yeah. when we first set this up, it's like, well, what do you mean they're going to be wandering around our... Co Everyone signs a CDA, yeah. right? And if yeah. they, you know, don't follow yeah. what they should be doing, yeah. right, they'll get kicked off the site. Yeah. So I think if you go in with the assumption that everyone's going to be, you yeah. know, behave themselves and yeah. actually follow, yeah. the, you know, the, the the appropriate principles, then actually you're you're, you're pretty safe. And you don't have to have barriers and passes mm -hmm. and everything else. And actually, we've done it in Boston mm -hmm. now in Waltham, mm -hmm. and actually created. You know, we had a half-empty building in Boston, which is now packed and has a waiting list for biotechs to come in, right. and in Gothenburg as well. Yeah. Now in Cambridge it's a little bit different because we're already in the middle of a biotech cluster so yeah. it's a little bit less important but yeah. for those sites that are a little bit more isolated and not right in the midst, you know, not in Kendall mm. Square or mm. not in, you know, mm. in Lund for example in, in, mm. in Sweden, um, it makes quite a big difference having this sort of vibrant, yeah, um, sure. vibrant, vibrant environment. Well Kendall Square has almost become a hiring hub rather than a yes, kind of that's right. that information that's right. spreading hub yeah. because people yeah. aren't necessarily collaborating yeah. there. there. Just hiring the folks from. Well, the coffee. You know, the nice thing about these things is so. What I find about us being in Cambridge is the. Um, you know, you go to a coffee shop or you drop your kids off mm. at school, mm. and you bump into someone that you know happens to be a haematologist that's right. just come over as yeah, working out, yeah. and you can start to talk about things that yeah. you know we couldn't talk about when we were in Cheshire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the the the, the environment's yeah. just different, and yeah. so it's actually amazing how many. Collaborations and relationships have been have been initiated through these informal connections. Mm. So one of the things I've been trying to do over the years is try and generate as many opportunities for our scientists to have informal connections mm. 
whether it's with people in the buyer house, whether it's with collaborators, yeah. where you're just making it easy for the serendipitous to happen. Yeah. And then again, I think yeah. Yeah, innovation can happen. Yeah, planning for yeah, planning for uh, serendipity. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that this, that's been apparent from the outside is the way that you've approached innovation as an active process. And five hours is a yeah is a very good illustration of that. Do you measure it year on year? So we measure. So I mean, we measure lots of things. I've yeah. got a great um, portfolio management group. I, I measure it, but don't necessarily incentivize on it. So I think mm. you know we measure how many proof of mechanisms mm. we've done. We measure our proof of concepts. So mm. obviously, we get rewarded for things like phase three investment decisions mm. and launches. Um, we measure how many publications are coming out from which groups. Mm. Um, but actually, I, I try not to get too. We 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 tend to do first of all three year rolling averages, so mm. no one is ever yeah. pressured into doing something in one year and hitting a number. Mm. Um, and actually, the the focus really is on the quality of what people are doing. Mm. You know how I- I- innovative is it? How mm. inventive is it? Mm. You know, is it going to lead to a you know hopefully to a breakthrough mm. in a therapy area or in terms of cap- capability? So, so, you've, so you've got trend lines rather than targets. Yeah, we, we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we, we, we're quite careful about that um, because it it drives. The, I just think it drives the wrong behaviour yeah. if you're not careful. Yeah. Um, People start gaming whatever they're given as a target. Scientists yeah. are brilliant yeah. at doing that. Yeah. You know, you give whatever target they you give them. They're very. Mm. I mean, they're good at hitting yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and again, the CD one. I mean, it's it's, it's amazing what behaviour. You know, so you know, in, in the two thousand five two thousand ten period. Because they were a war on sea, I mean, the number of backups we had in the pipeline, yeah, yeah. backup number one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, yeah. and of course all the backups had exactly the same probability of success as the lead molecule. Yes, yes. So we don't do backups anymore. Right. Um, so very, I, very I, rarely. I remember sitting in yeah. Sweden once listening to a team saying, well, it doesn't matter if this one doesn't work because you've got a backup. Exactly. Well, how does that not matter? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because you keep, you're in a job for another couple of years, but... That's exactly right. But you've got and the same now, problem. Now, yeah. unless it's a really, really important program, they yeah. know they're going to get one shot. So yeah. they've got a time. Yeah. They've got to work out the quality of the molecule versus taking a bit more time mm. to get you know, rid mm. of a few more of the of, of the wards. So yeah. it's, a, it's a real balancing act. And for some programs, we will have backups, but they're unusual. Yeah. Less than 5% of our pipeline now is backups. Yeah, interesting times. Interesting. And, <laughs> and, and what's been the biggest learning for you as a, as a kind of director of all of this activity over, the, over that period? You know, I've been. I've worked in different well, companies. Done I, 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 there's not a lot I would have done differently. Actually, I've, I've seen why I've go through before we got was acquired by Pfizer. Go through, you know, a relatively similar um, transformation. Now, Bob Ruffalo, was the head of R and D at the time, was much more focused on the numbers of things. Mm. Um, but we, ha- he had a leadership team that was very passionate about science, and so we all were very much focused on the quality of the science. Um, I think that, you know, the the, the biggest piece is celebrating the wins but also celebrating the failure the good failures mm-hmm. um and then exemplifying them constantly exemplifying individuals teams projects mm-hmm. you know we were lucky that we had to grisso and limpaza mm-hmm. there's two things i mean to grisso in mm-hmm. particular which came from our, mm-hmm. our our teams in orderly park actually which went from you know we put the resources behind it and it was a new generation when i arrived and we moved it in as a CD, and then it went from CD to launch in you know about three years. Mm. Now that was a brilliant thing to have coming along because it was an example of what you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can vary some of those timelines. Yeah. Right? yeah, and so and of course having a quick win like that also made the organisation feel better about itself. Mm. Limpaza, which was written off, we resurrected and brought back to life, even mm. though we'd never really stopped working on it in yeah. the IMED. Yeah, you know when Pascal joined, he asked, well, "Why isn't this in phase three? Right again, it suddenly yeah, pumped yeah. everyone's chests up, and yeah. then you know, and then everything we've been doing in cardiovascular respiratory has been about rebuilding. Yeah. Um, and and you know, and you've got Vicenra now doing really really well. We've yeah. got our T step molecule. Yeah. So there's, a, there's there's lots of really cool stuff in every area that we're working, in, and that, of course that makes it easier to to work hard and keep going. So so what you've described almost sounds like the early stage of. Of an exponential growth, rather than just. I hope you know, so. I mean, rather than so seeing all the results. So, so far, the other yeah. piece, the other piece I love about our company is we are a humble. I think we are a humble company. You yeah. know, starting with Pascal and, and his leadership team, all the way through um, our leaders and our scientists, um, and you know, whilst we've got better, mm. you know, I think I've, I've said this to you previously, we're still failing eighty percent of the time, mm. right? So we've got lots of room for improvement. Mm. 
And you know, there's very few companies that have been able to continuously, in five year cycles, continue to be at the mm. top end of the productivity charts. Mm. And so, you know, we've had a good five years, mm. right? Mm. It's one set of five years. So for me, the huge challenge is, is you know, making sure we continue to do this, that a pipeline continues to fuel new launches and new mm. medicines, that no one in the organization gets complacent in any way, shape or form, that we remain humble, collaborative, open, mm. um, and porous to ideas, whether they're from inside or outside. Mm. Which has been an interesting characterization of the change, I think. And that, yeah. I mean, that, that humility seems at odds with where AstraZeneca were in my external perception to, to, to where it is today. So, so what drives you personally in this in this space? Um, I've, I've I've always been a so the thing I, it's, you know, it's difficult now not to not to think of myself as a leader. But I always used to get really upset when people called me you know a line manager or a leader versus a scientist. I'm mm -hmm. a scientist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I get excited about seeing people's data, yeah. um, not the sort of bullet points on a yeah. PowerPoint slide, but the actual data. Yeah. Um, the and graphs, so, the and points, science, and, and scientists in your approach to the to the day job as well, I guess. It's and, yeah. it, and it's and it's keener. So we know we we you know I still have um, um, a couple of students, and um, I don't spend anywhere near enough time with them. But you know I've tried yeah. to keep my um, academic links. Yeah. Um, but more important is just encouraging science, encu constantly encouraging science, constantly mm. speaking to our science, going and seeing their projects, seeing them present their posters. You know. Mm seeing the next generation, you know, encouraging the next generation of science and science leaders to come through. Mm. To me, that's the, you know, the first driver is just the quality of the science and being an organization that you can say and be really proud of doing good science. Mm. Second one is about being collaborative. Mm. Um, mm. I've always been Not quite well, collaborative yeah. by yeah. nature yeah. and I get irritated actually by people that um, hoard data or sort mm. of think that they can't share things. Mm. Uh, and so. Um, and I've noticed because you're active on Twitter too that uh, <laughs> that's uh, you know how do you feel about that as a collaborative? It's know, good. So we've got exchange. we've got this new thing called Workplace, which is um which is a spin-off from Facebook, and it's actually working really well. Where you can start to post, you know, so someone will post us, you know, a bit of scientific data, and then you can ask questions and yeah. you can generate chats. Like Twitter is a great place yeah. for. I see it more for news and just yeah. you know getting people's opinions on things that are coming out, particularly mm. if they're from from outside of AZ. Mm. Um, but you know this being open to open to ideas wherever they come from and being mm. porous and and, mm. and, and, and you, know, you can talk about being collaborative and then you can be collaborative and and I yeah. really want us to be collaborative. Yeah. So I are on the side probably of being too open rather than mm. less open. Mm. Um, if I ever have to choose and yeah. if it's worked for us, yeah. I think the risks are relatively small and, and the, the companies um, embrace that and the upside yeah. is is, yeah. is huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then. Um, I mean, th those are the, the two things, and then, and then the other piece that I'm incredibly passionate about, which is, which you know, again, actually, and Catherine in the room here is an example of it, is developing our talent. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, I've seen it happen um, all through my career, actually, as I've as I've grown um, through industry. But surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you are, mm -hmm. but also pulling people up more rapidly, and and I kind of think about my career journey, and you know, I've been lucky to have some managers that were quite or leaders that were prepared to take risks on me and sort of mm. propel me up mm. the, up the line mm. probably more quickly than I was ever expecting or not probably a lot more quickly than I was ever expecting and yeah, yeah. where some people were going are you, are you sure about that um, and, I, and I kind of have the same conversation with my leaders and their leaders about take risks on people yeah. if you haven't got people in places that are a little bit uncomfortable yeah. and really pushing themselves and finding out that they can really swim versus sink so you'll never yeah. accelerate people's careers and so that's something that we spend quite a lot of time with my mm. team and their teams mm. so I spend a lot of time doing talent development and really trying to pull out the bright sparks yeah. faster than they would otherwise have um that's interesting have, uh, have, have moved. I'm gonna ask Catherine do we have two more minutes yeah I'm, I'm gonna do the two minute kind okay, of cool. uh, the timeline then they're not distracting, move distracting move. me if, if yeah. that's okay well I'll cut this bit out um <laughs> 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 um, She's the boss. Yeah, I'll, I'll still apply a two-minute rule just to make okay. it easier. Um, okay, so within the spirit of a two-minute rule, so what? Yeah. What? what, what um, uh, you, you clearly read a lot. Um, <laughs> what, what books do you go back to as your kind of core 
know, which books would you recommend? For yeah, so, the, to read so there's a, so the one that's probably closest to my heart from a heart strings perspective is probably Roy Vangelos's autobiography mm -hmm. okay. um, around I think science, medicine, and Merck. That was a great period at Merck as well. well and, yeah. and for me, he was. I mean, apart from that, he's from the island next to me in Greece. Okay. Um, and he's, you know, obviously of Greek heritage, like I am. Um, you know, I've never had a scientist in my family, and so seeing, reading his, I just read his book, and it was just amazing what he did. And, and Merck for me, actually, when I was doing my PhD, that was the prototypical, you know, what a great R and D organization looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually did a, a PhD that was sponsored by them. And Roy was like a hero, right? He, he'd made, he, he, you know, he was one of the first science-led CEOs. Yeah. And he and he took a company and really, to me, he epitomized the science-led organization. And so, I, 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 you know, I, I got, that's probably one of my favorite drug discovery books. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. That I read and kind of, you know, and I've never actually met him, but I would love to meet him. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think he did an amazing job. And actually yeah. you saw what happened when Merck yeah. Lost that science focus a little bit. They, they, they've company, got yeah. it back now, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and I think it makes a huge difference. That for me has been one of my guiding yeah. lights um, yeah. all, all through my career. And then when when I was at Wyeth, actually, I met Bill George for the first time. We've met him. Well, I've been at AstraZeneca a few times. He's written a book um, called "Discover Your True North," okay. and that's about what are your guiding principles? Yeah. What are the th your, what what are your yeah. true norths and and, and sticking to them, yeah. or actually, actually not sticking to them, knowing yeah. what they are, so yeah. you can Heading stick to them. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that has been something that again I've used. Yeah. You know, I remember yeah. when I first joined the company, <coughs> I wrote down my list of four or five things that were the most important things for me. Many of which we've talked about mm. Um, mm. over the past few minutes, and sticking to those principles and not ever letting them go mm. because they're what define you. Yeah. Have been really important. Fantastic. And what are your ambitions for the next five years? To do this, I, love, I think we're <laughs> blessed. I think, I think we have the the, the best jobs yeah. in the world. Honestly, yeah. our scientists yeah. and R&D organisations, yeah. you know, we're able to turn science into medicine and, and really see the impact of what we do. And you know, we, we've for me, I've completed part one of my journey at AstraZeneca. Yeah. We now to need to show that we can do it again yeah. and that we can actually hopefully improve yeah. even further. Yeah. That it wasn't. Uh, a bit, it was a yeah, it's not. We're not lucky. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. something that's going to we can continue. So, yeah. I want to just keep doing. I love doing what I'm doing. Fantastic. And, and one thing that you wish that I'd asked you that I haven't asked you is the last question. <laughs> <coughs> How'd you relax? Because <laughs> <Yeah, exactly. laughs> right. it's, it's, as I'm sure you know, you know from speaking to the, these are pretty intense jobs. Yeah. Um, and so my family probably are the thing that brings me down to earth. You know, yeah. we're talking about your kid being a, yeah. a, a guitarist. My kids are, are young; they're nine and ten. Uh, my wife's a scientist, but she, they're, they're all very good at when I come home to making me silly daddy and yeah. Yeah. and just bringing me completely down to earth. Yeah. And I find that the most re relaxing thing out there is being with my family. Useful centering. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I know that there's a thousand questions I could have content continued to ask you. Um, hopefully we'll get to do it again. Brilliant. And uh, maybe put you next to Roy Vagelos as well. Oh, that would be, be cool. That would be nice. Thanks cool. again, really. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers.